s'est pas trompé. Non, c'est bien. <rire> Bonjour. Bonjour. Bonjour Florence. Bonjour. Good afternoon Florence. Good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome to all of you. Um, <laughs> On parlait de ça il y a juste 30 secondes. We were talking about this 30 seconds ago, Exactement. all these doubts. On n'est pas encore d'accord là-dessus. We still don't know. Bienvenue à cette conférence, anyway, cette discussion autour de, de votre dernier livre. Welcome to this discussion about your last book, your latest book, here and elsewhere, which you're going to be signing after the session upstairs. If anyone uh, wants to listen to this session in English, you can <laughs> grab a headset. <laughs> okay. So, here and elsewhere, Alors, Edition Olivier, je, de l'Olivier. Um, bon, Florence Aubenard, let's keep this simple. What you, you are what we call an international correspondent, a journalist always on the move, whose life is constant traveling, coming home, traveling, never taking time to catch your breath. This is what you write in your introduction. We'll come back to your introduction because I find it extremely interesting. So you've published this book with this lovely title here and elsewhere, which speaks to us, which projects us into the future and elsewhere. So what does that mean here and elsewhere? And what is it? It's a compilation of 50 articles that you've chosen, that you wrote for for Le Monde, uh, entre 2015 et 2022, the newspaper that you worked for between 2015 and 2022, 50 stories that take us onto the back roads of information. Uh, you uh, tell us about the, P the yellow vests at the roundabouts, the Islamic terrorist attacks in Paris or Brussels, people who uh, go to take part in the jihad, uh, retirement homes during the first COVID lockdown, and the war seen from a Ukrainian village. It's very rich and varied and a bit surrealistic, although your feet are firmly on the ground. And it's an excellent uh, testimonial of our time and gives us a lot of food for thought. But sometimes you go off in other directions. Uh, farther from current events, you won the Kessel Prize in 2010. You have several awards. You lead us by the hand in your book uh, to meet a woman who's living in the woods in the Seven Mountains. It's totally It's a, a a very strange story, and we'll talk about it later. You also go to a huge supermarket and tell about people's, the lives of the people who work there, as if you're undercover. Uh, did anyone tell you you, you were very indiscreet? I don't know. No one's ever accused me of that. Indiscreet, je sais pas, c'est... Indiscreet. Mm. It's strange that you would say that because I wrote a book called The Night Cleaner. I went to Normandy to Caen and I registered in my with my in my own name, but without saying that I was a news uh, reporter. And I said I was looking for a job. I resisted the impulse to say I'm going to go into people's houses and see how they live and tell about their lives. My aim was to not be indiscreet and only describe how they were in the workplace and not uh, draw portraits of the cleaners at home. But uh, I, think, I guess you think it was indiscreet anyway. Well, if you delve into the book and I advise you to buy it, have it signed, and then read it in whichever order you choose. No, it's important to buy books. 
Actually, you're like a sponge. That's what I mean by indiscreet. Nothing escapes you. You hear all, the, dis all the, the conversations. We can talk about how you work in the field, but it's as if you have ears uh, on all sides of your body. Uh, so when I say indiscreet, it's in a positive way. You're interested in people, you meet them, you want to meet them, and I don't know how you do it, but I think you have several brains because you can be listening to the conversation that's going on next to you while carrying on a conversation uh, with whoever you're with. Yes, well, that's the good side of my job. When you're a reporter or a journalist, uh, people say, how do you prepare your questions? How do you decide what you're going to ask? Our aim is to ask as few questions as possible and observe what's going on without stepping in if you, if you see a situation uh, taking form, taking shape. You were talking about the COVID lockdown in a retirement home. It was very interesting. I spent a lot of time in the kitchen because that's where the news was being exchanged. And it was a really exciting experience because in this home, and I'm sure it's the same in Switzerland, most of the staff are women. They come out to work and their husbands were locked down and were staying at home. So the, for the first time, the roles were reversed. And whenever their phones beeped, they'd say, ah, he wants to know how I'm supposed to bath the child. Ha, 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 how does the microwave work? So their husbands were learning how to get by in daily life. So your son is 10 years old and it's the first time his father's given him a bath. So there was that whole side of it. I would never have thought of asking him this question, what are your husbands doing at home? And the husbands would say, oh, don't go to work. I'm the one who should be going to work. Why do you want to go to work? But they were there every day. One of them said, and it was quite eloquent, her husband didn't want her to take public transport because he thought it was too dangerous with COVID all around. And so he would drive her, and he, but he, <laughs> uh, he said, don't, don't, no, don't sit next to me, sit in the back. And she said, I'm worse, it's, it's worse, it's like as if I were the dog. So if you ask these women, is it difficult to leave home to come to work in the morning? They would never give you this answer. Uh, so it's much better to just listen than get involved in a conversation. So let's look at things uh, concretely. If you're in the back of the car with, these, with this couple, do you listen and take notes, or do you take notes afterwards in your hotel room? How do you put the things you've heard down on paper? In general, journalists are not allowed to hide their identities. It's illegal to do so. I usually keep my notebook with me because it's a good, good way to hide your face. Anyway, I take notes so that people realize I'm a journalist. So that they're aware. And, and uh, if, if they think I'm being too indiscreet, I'll say, well, it's okay, we can, we can write this. And sometimes people, can, can, I, can I write this? And people will say, yes, yes, go ahead. <laughs> they're much less shy than a lot of politicians who don't want you to write anything. Or CEOs of big companies who have communication staff. The first articles I wrote uh, involved going door to door. I was working for Libération, and I'd knock on people's doors, and I'd say, uh, your son killed the neighbor. Can you tell me about that? And I thought I was going to get kicked out, but not at all. People don't have a lot of people they can talk to in these circumstances. And they're quite happy, usually quite uh, happy to tell about it. And it was, I wouldn't say heartbreaking, but they were so vulnerable. Uh, what, what could, and I thought, what can I do with this, all this information they're giving me? I don't know if I can publish it all. Uh, sometimes I would give them little media tips and say, wait, don't say that. Non, en même temps, là, yeah, dans votre, dans votre livre commence par une, une, une étrange situation. Uh, 
c'est un peu ce qu'on qu qu vit quand on fait du reportage. Je pense qu'on l'a tous vécu, cette situation-là. Euh, vous vous réveillez à un like endroit. Euh, en gros, vous êtes à Burundi, dans un hôtel. Vous êtes à Burundi, dans un hôtel. En gros, c'est une espèce de morning. Qu'est-ce que je fous là Où je suis Et tout de suite, vous avez un moment ah, ouais, existentiel. Vous pensez, qu'est-ce que je fais ici C'est quelque chose qui vous marque plus, même que votre kidnapping. Enfin, ce sont des choses qui ont laissé une plus grande impression sur vous que quand vous êtes kidnappé en Irak. Et c'était un moment définitif dans votre carrière, peut-être dans votre carrière. C'est intéressant parce que c est, c est, vous dites que le livre c'est intéressant parce que vous dites que le livre que vous livrez maintenant, et, et je pense le reste aussi de, de vos œuvres, hein, des, des livres que vous avez publiés. Qu'est-ce qui, qu qui fait qu'à ce moment-là euh, Est-ce qu'on est qu a une forme de... We're influenced moi, j ai, j ai by that une forme de quasiment à la limite du burn-out, quoi. <rire> non Were you at, a, on the verge of a burn-out Il y avait quelque chose, oui, de... de yes, something like that. Lost in translation. Oui, c'est ça, oui. You know, I was, I was <rire> lost in intersideral space. C'est vrai que l'idée de, rac de raconter ça, de se poser une question autour de... Quand est-ce qu'on quand est-ce qu'on bascule dans yourself, quelque chose Quand est-ce qu'on change d'avis com Comment uh, ça se passe Mais venu parce que, comme vous le rappeliez, j'ai été uh, présent dans le cas de l'Irak. Alors, immanquablement, les gens disaient « Alors, oui, alors depuis votre prise de tâche, tout a changé pour vous. » Alors, malheureusement, non. Well, unfortunately, no, it hasn't. Je vois bien, les gens disent « Mais ça va maintenant, tu es venu, tu as une énorme déception. » Et quand je dis « Oui, je suis bien, je peux voir qu'ils sont vraiment déçus. »« Bon, alors, elle ne va pas aller si bien que ça, elle nous ment, 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 elle nous ment. » Et donc, il y avait cette espèce d'envie qu'il y a un avant-après. Et du coup, je me suis posé la question moi-même, mais quand même, peut-être c'est vrai que c'est... Qu'est-ce qui ne va pas Et donc, je me suis dit, est-ce qu'à un moment, j'ai eu ça Un moment où... On sent que ce ne sera plus tout à fait pareil. Et ce moment-là est un moment très, très fugitif d'une certaine façon. Et je me suis dit que c'était un moment où j'ai fait un reportage et c'était le moment où j'étais dans une mission moins expérimentée, où je commençais à en tout cas à faire du reportage à l'étranger. Je me suis dit que c'était moins expérimenté, où je commençais en tout cas à faire du reportage à l'étranger. Et là, vous êtes enthousiaste, vous prenez comme un affront personnel quand vous êtes dans quelque chose à l'autre bout du monde et que ce n'est pas vous que le journal envoie. Et donc, vous allez en Burundi, il y a des tremblements de terre en Algérie, vous allez en Algérie, et donc, il y a cette espèce de fureur où vous êtes dans tout, dans toutes les tempêtes tempête du monde. Donc, j'étais à ce moment-là de ma vie, en fait. Et les reportages s'enchaînaient, et dès qu'on disait, là, il faudrait partir, oui, immédiatement, j'ai changé les habits d'hiver, et j'ai été en direction de l'endroit où j'allais sur le globe. Et à un moment, j'étais dans un hôtel, et je me suis levé, je me réveille, c'est le matin, et je vais dans un coin, mon sac ouvert, mon ordinateur sur la table, et je vais dans un coin, mon sac ouvert, mon ordinateur sur la table, et je suis incapable de me souvenir dans quel pays je suis. Et donc je me souviens de quel pays je suis. Et alors il a dû se passer quelque chose, sinon je ne serais pas là. Mais qu'est-ce qui s'est passé, et où je suis, je n'arrive pas à me souvenir. Et ça a été un moment pour moi, et ça a été un moment pour moi, et ça a été un moment pour moi. Un moment pour moi And it was a terrible parce que je me suis dit quel manque de respect. Je vais sortir dans la rue et il y a deux minutes, je ne me rappelais plus où j'étais. Quand j'ai sorti sur la rue, je me suis dit, wow, c'est bizarre, ça fait 10 minutes que je ne savais pas où j'étais. Je me suis dit, ça ne devrait jamais m'arriver à moi. C'est un manque de respect pour les gens de ce pays. Donc j'ai changé ma façon de travailler en fait, j'ai changé de temps de mission. J'ai pris des pauses entre les missions, j'ai resté plus longtemps à des endroits, j'ai changé de façon de travailler. Professionnellement, j'ai eu un avant-après, ça en fait partie en tout cas. So if there was a before and an after in my professional life, this was definitely an important moment in it. On parle de point de rupture, mais un point de faiblesse aussi, non? So maybe it was a breaking point. Maybe it was a. Voilà, la grande lessiveuse de l'actualité. Donc quoi, en gros non? Il y a pas un peu ça? Moi j'ai jamais eu cette impression là parce qu'en fait. Or weariness? No, I never got that impression. I've always been fortunate to work for newspapers that I want to read, which is a huge privilege. Et de ne pas être obligé de and travailler pour ce journal et d'avoir le coup de téléphone. Évidemment, ça avait arrivé deux trois fois. Get a call. It did happen to me a couple of times. Editors in chief. Une espèce de syndrome à Paris, à Paris, parce que c'est là où est basée ma rédaction. La rédaction à Paris ne comprend rien à ce qu'on fait sur le terrain. Who would say? Oh, in Paris they don't understand. Have to say in Paris they don't understand what we're doing in the field. It only happened to me a couple of times, and I've always been in sync with the newspapers I work for, and that's a big advantage when the world is in disorder. En gros, c'est 40 ans d'expérience. Bon, là, on le voit. Mais en même temps, vous avez vu évoluer ce, ce métier, les médias, 
the profession and the media evolve, you've seen working conditions change, worsen? No, I don't really agree with that. In fact, there are lines of... I'd say that there are different kinds of changes, different lines of change. There's been technological change. I remember the first the time a journalist called me and said, I'd like to know what the press was like before internet. And I thought, well, hmm. What was reassuring was that I was listening to an interview with Joseph Kessel the uh, le, very le, famous French reporter. Oui, mais enfin, vous avez vécu comme une and sacrée révolution technique, etc. Et l'autre disait oui, vous avez vécu comme une sacrée révolution technique, etc. Et l'autre disait oui, vous avez vécu comme une sacrée révolution technique, etc. Et l'autre disait oui, vous avez vécu comme une sacrée he, he thought the biggest revolution was uh, aviation. So with internet, it's true that everything moves faster. And in our profession, I think there's a major advantage. Time is not the same. Uh, of course, there will always be somebody who's quicker at sending their photos in than you. Uh, but there's no longer a race to get a scoop. It's different for some media, of course, but we don't work that way anymore. Alongside that, today, and I understand this perfectly well, there's a lot of um, distrust in the press. In France, Monday is the first day of the press week. Uh, we get calls from teachers who want us to come out. Now, 100% of what they want to hear about is, is disinformation. And school textbooks are fake news. On the press or other books on the press all talk about fake news today. So what message are we sending? We're telling people you can't trust the press, you can't trust written information, and how can you uh, deal with this? So that's... When I became a journalist, we got our press card. We had an armband that said meet press on it. We had a bulletproof vest. We had a press thing for our car and another one for the outside door of the car. So we were fully equipped. And that was a protective shield. The first wars I covered in Africa, in Burundi, in Rwanda, in uh, DRC, uh, these things really gave us a lot of protection. I remember yelling at Congolese soldiers, I don't think I do that today, saying, don't get in my car with your guns and your dirty boots. No, no, I'm a journalist. This is my car. We're not involved in this conflict. So, that worked then, but if you put press, uh, a press uh, sticker on your car, that would be a, like putting a target on your hand. So, this is a physical change in a number of countries in conflict with violent uh, wars. It's a moral uh, change in our countries. A lot of people will tell you that. Yeah, if you knock on people's doors today, they'll say, oh, you're from the press, no thank you. So I've got my own secret weapon. I knock on the door. People say, at least in France, they look at me and they say, hmm, she looks familiar. Where did I see her? Not last night at the nightclub, not at the butchers. Where have I seen her? And Somebody will say, ah, are you Florence Artaud? No, no, sorry, Florence Artaud is dead. And then they'll say, and I see their eyes getting bigger and bigger. And then she calls her husband. Oh, come, come and see who's at the door, a hostage. But it breaks the ice. Et pourtant, vous écrivez que vous étiez un otage nul. Nul. But you say you were a terrible hostage. Yes, I was very bad hostage. That's what my uh, my jailers said. Le livre fait un bien fou, en tout cas. 
The book is very uplifting, heartening in a way, because we realize that there is still room for new stories. You are the embodiment of the idea that journalism, far from being overtaken by uh, chat GPT, uh, is about going out into into the field, the field, the field, the field. That's what I, one of the first things I learned in my profession. Roger Dizbach, my editor in chief, would say, "What are you doing in front of your computer? Get out, go." Take a look around and come back later. And I found that same sentiment in your book. Some of these articles date back to 2015. They're a bit old. Maybe they, we think maybe they have date, they've been outdated, but they're not. The stories are still just as powerful, and we feel the breeze of history. Yes, it was a strange experience to choose these articles with Olivier Cohen from Edition de l'Olivier. You have to read everything you have written in the last 10 years. It's not always pleasant. We tried to choose texts that told a story. But a story in which the end is not necessarily included. Let me explain. The f uh, Emmanuel Macron's first presidential campaign. We did, so we don't know at that time what would happen even six months later, what he would become. So this is what I was interested in. It was writing about the hope that there was in 2017, which we will see in a very different way now in hindsight, and ask ourselves what was going to unfold afterwards. What's interesting for me in journalism is walking on this tightrope where the end of the story hasn't been written. You might fall off on one side or the other of the tightrope, you're not very sure, you keep going. You're working uh, uh, is sort of in a void. So we tried to choose, choose stories that were open-ended. What is going to happen with COVID in our society or other pandemics? What is going to happen with terrorism, the president, the war in Ukraine? That was also one of my aims, was to leave things open-ended. Why 2015? Why didn't you choose anything from before or after? And why did you not put these stories in context? Why did you uh, not put these stories in context. Ah, oui. Explain why you chose an article, why you thought it was interesting, why you thought it was a testimony to its time. Well, I flipped through my articles, and I thought most of these articles don't have anything to do with communications, people, uh, film stars, or, or anything like that. So for me, it was like a photo album. And I think, oh, when you when you look through a photo album, you say, oh, that's so-and-so's wedding. You remember shared memories. So that was my idea. What did we all, what were our common experiences as a society? What were the tones and colors of the time? Some of these articles, uh, I, didn't, I didn't really remember. I didn't remember the fear we had at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. And when I read the article again, it came back to me. So, this is what I was looking for when I chose the articles. Why 2015? Well, it's because when I, we looked at the articles, we didn't want a mismatched collection and put just throw things together, uh, a, a sort of random compilation. So we thought, what is the red thread? What is the underlying design. And the word that came to us was war, the terrible word of war, which has been used rightly and wrongly for situations that weren't a war, the war on terrorism, the war on COVID, uh, the war of the, red, of the yellow vests. Uh, of course, the war in Ukraine, which is a real war. So that's the red thread. And anyway, in my experience, uh, from 2015 on, we've seen increased intentions that we're still seeing now. So that was our guiding uh, light. And all of the articles have an element of, of their time in them. Did you put them in chronological order? Yes. 
Donc le, le titre est ici et ailleurs. Alors, je, je the title is here and elsewhere, and I must confess that I didn't uh, find the title. Dit, oui, titre génial, the editor said, I have a great title for you. And I said, okay. He said, here, and I, I, I understood, here is elsewhere, not here and elsewhere. I said, oh, that's a great title, here is elsewhere. And we both had a different title in mind. And, we were, and then when I saw the, the book come out, I said, wait, there's a spelling mistake on the cover. And he said, no, you didn't understand what I told you at the beginning. And I said, oh, no, I didn't. So it's a misunderstanding which I find very amusing. And the idea was, Ici, uh, to have et ailleurs, est ailleurs. here Donc, le, and elsewhere, exemple, and here uh, is elsewhere. Y a de, vous en parliez de ces jeunes gens qui partent faire le djihad. You mentioned uh, young people who, young people from France, uh, également Belgique, from Belgium who go en to fait, the uh, Middle East to engage in the djihad. Des jeunes gens exactement du même âge, and mais qui, I had qui already aussi, reported on young people, terme, same age, mais un voyage who were doing a sort of rite of passage journey to change things by going on holiday in Thailand. So, uh, so here and elsewhere. Holiday in Thailand, Jihad. Les gilets jaunes et aussi and we had the yellow vests and the hypermarket. Donc, so these are like mirror images jaunes, of each other. Do you, do you know what the yellow vests are in France? <laughs> uh, if I have to explain <laughs> this. <laughs> yeah. I'm not ever <laughs> sure <laughs> what can be exported <laughs> and what can't. <laughs> Seems to have worked. There was uh, something that I found really interesting. This is why I decided to do my story on the hypermarket. We had uh, in November and December really cold weather, and the yellow vests were uh, warming their hands on the fire and grilling sausages, and they decided to carry out an action. And everybody was scratching their heads, what can we do that would have an impact? And opposite the roundabout, there was a hypermarket. They thought, aha, let's do something in the hypermarket. And everybody said, yeah, but uh, no, you know, uh, these are big revolutionaries. Uh, I don't know. My niece works at the till, and other, someone else would say, oh, I go there every day. I don't want to hurt them. So they decided that they're on va, on va remplir un caddie, action would be to fill a trolley with goods, go to the till, leave the till, leave the, till, leave, the, leave, the leave the trolley there, yell donc, something, on, shout something, and run off. Already on the parking lot, you know, on the car park, possible, half of them just donc, refused to go in. Rentrent, and the few who are left donc, went in, and so I followed them. And I said, so what are you going to put in your trolley that you're going to leave at the till? What they put in was what they dreamed of. Some of them, uh, uh, a huge pot, uh, a huge uh, jar of Nutella, uh, luxury tuna. One put, uh, a guy put uh, women's underwear, the Christmas presents for their children, things they couldn't afford or would love to buy. And then uh, they left everything at the till. And so the, the idea was always to show both sides of the coin, both sides of the story. So the world is in disarray, but is it more in disarray than before? I think every period has its own kind of disorder. So that won't work as a marketing tool for your book then. When we... When you reread these texts, were you ever ashamed or did you have regrets about how you'd written the article? Or comment, retrospectivement, on analyse son propre travail? How do you look back on your own work with what kind of gaze? Well, if I had too many regrets, then I didn't include the article in the book, obviously. Grosso modo, plus que l'idée de d'être complètement à côté de la plaque. Alors, parfois. Par exemple, well, sometimes, un peu avant ça, j'étais allé en Syrie. That, en Syrie, 
Personnellement, j'étais persuadée in Syria, que le I gouvernement était le régime de Bachar Al-Assad. Uh, C'était le moment des printemps arabes, etc. Uh, Alors, j'ai jamais right écrit le gouvernement va tomber, hein, c'est le reportage, donc j'ai fait beaucoup d'analyses, vraiment très bien, j'ai des lecteurs aussi, surtout. Donc, le, le... Mais c'est sûr qu'il y avait, à certains moments, cette tonalité-là, que je j'assume, enfin, je pense que c'était la tonalité de l'époque, et je pense qu'il faut... Il faut les garder, il n'y a rien de réécrit. I could feel at the Mais time. le... le... Les, les and that was reflected in my articles one way or another. But the articles là, là, where you raté. say, no, Alors, voilà, tout simplement. Uh, souvent this, quand, uh, this uh, on avait, I didn't manage. Savez, vous, vous, y a, y a une chose that happens, dans la presse, and there's something absolutely horrible ce que with the le casting. C'est-à-dire, vous partez avec une uh, idée préconçu de ce que vous avez trouvé et vous vous y restez agréable. Alors, en télé, ils vont jusqu'à dire « Là, il faudra une jeune blonde, etc. » Bon, en presse écrite, il y a moins ces critères-là, mais de fait, euh, bah, je, je vous donne un exemple de casting. Euh, quand je vais en Ukraine, euh, au, tout au début de l'invasion, Right at the beginning of the invasion, a certain number of people, wealthy people, people sheltered in a fairly chic and expensive ski resort with five-star hotels. It's the Ukrainian Kurchevel, so it's very expensive, very chic. You're there with wealthy people, the oligarchs have already left, but they're right below the oligarchs. So they're luxury refugees. I call up my newspaper, I say I'm sending you an article. Article about this. Uh, I hear a pause. Uh, on the other hand, my editor in chief uh, tells me, "Are you sure people want to hear about that? Want to read about that?" Formatage, c'est-à-dire qu'un réfugié doit être pauvre. Refugees are supposed to be poor. They have to be sad. Luxury refugees. Well, they did publish my article, but that's what I mean. If you go and cover the situation of the refugees, then they have to be poor. Or they have to be sad, they have to have nothing to eat. Uh, so sometimes uh, I uh, cling to uh, my prejudices. Something uh, passed by me, me and I didn't manage to, uh, uh, to hold on to it. And so that's uh, the missed, uh, missed opportunities. Uh, how do you find your topic? How do you work on your topic? If I take the example of uh, Jérôme Laronce, pas chose, en réalité, pour les problèmes administratifs, vous le racontez bien, murdered for no reason at all. C'est quoi He was just selling cattle in France. Did you mean to say that you wanted to understand what had happened? What are your sources? How do you uh, how do you work on these issues upstream? Jérôme Laronce is a, a farmer. Le Charolais. Donc, le Charolais. He lives in the Charolais region. I'm sure you love meat here. There are no vegetarians here. La viande persillée française, le gros steak. Your traditional steak comes from the Charolais region in France. C'est une région compliquée aujourd'hui, mais avec des élevages de bovins, de bêtes à viande. Cattle breeding. Et donc lui est non pas un jeune agriculteur, bio, tout ce qu'on veut. Young organic farmer. I love lui, young organic farmers, but he's not that. He comes from traditional farming family. family. He inherited uh, the, the farm, farm the grandfather took out a loan, added 10 cows, uh, and you've got to do better than him, and you need to preserve his inheritance, and uh, you've got to be worthy of him. And that's exactly what Jérôme Laronce is about. He's a big horse, a big dog, he's sort of a Giant. He starts breeding cattle. He's uh, the only uh, boy out of uh, five siblings. Some of the girls would like to take over the farm, but they're told no. Uh, it's got to be the boy. So it's very traditional. And then he realizes one thing uh, that everybody is starting to realize: uh, you shouldn't use as many antibiotics. Uh, your cattle should go to the pasture. And so in this very traditional family, uh, people start uh, frowning upon him. And little by little, he starts uh, being a little uh, at ease, a little bit of an outsider. And then there, um, there's uh, all the European paperwork for... Uh, 
ça prend des proportions. Alors on dit, non, mais, alors on ne peut pas enregistrer properly, la bête, donc on ne peut pas la vendre, donc if, il n'en vend pas une, mais l'autre non plus, l'autre lui dit, uh, donc tout, 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 ce problème it, prend une proportion énorme. Et ce, gar ce, ce, ce garçon qui adore ses bêtes, uh, qui refuse d'abattre un couple, une famille de renards qui lui dévore son poulailler tous les matins, en disant non, je te respecte les animaux, etc., voit devant lui son troupeau mourir, et donc devient maltraitant parce qu'il n'a plus les moyens cattle, de les nourrir, plus les moyens de les abattre, plus les moyens, voilà. Et donc, c'est well. cette histoire-là que je voulais raconter, parce qu'elle me semblait uh, uh, révélatrice d'un changement qui n'arrive pas à avoir lieu de, 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 de toutes ces ambiguïtés uh, de, de, de l'élevage aujourd'hui. Et, et ça faisait longtemps, on ne sait jamais trop comment, comment traiter ce type de sujet. Uh, et ça m'ennuyait de, de dire, voilà, Regardez, c'est un jeune homme, justement, dans le bio, etc., des histoires, je ne sais pas si on les connaît par cœur, mais qui sont un peu la couleur de l'époque. Et en général, ce qui m'intéresse davantage, c'est ces zones grises, ces zones compliquées, ces zones de transition où on ne sait pas trop où on est, et même, pour le bien de ces bêtes, se retrouve à les regarder mourir dans un pré. Et donc, c'est ça que je trouvais intéressant, c'est-à-dire, raconter des histoires dont on ne sont pas en noir et blanc, pour dire les choses. Voilà. Stories that are not black and white. Mais vous les comment vous les But how do you find these stories? Do you find them in other media? Do you have sources? Do people tell you about them? Well, in this particular case, je lis beaucoup la presse régionale. I la presse régionale française ou la presse étrangère. Je me renseigne beaucoup sur des choses très différentes. Lots of different kinds of things. So I'd seen, I'd seen a brief article about the story. What I was interested in, the other thing that I was interested in, was that uh, at his last inspection, his paperwork uh, was uh, hadn't been filled out properly. Il est, il est dans sa voiture, il s'est endormi, euh, il est caché dans les champs, uh, une voiture de gendarme le surprend, il veut redémarrer, uh, et il pense qu'il va leur tirer dessus, enfin, le gendarme pense qu'on va lui tirer dessus, en tout cas c'est comme ça qu'il uh, réalise, et, his, uh, et uh, il est abattu d'une balle, uh, donc, uh, et, et, et donc uh, en, en général en France on parle de ce type de situation dans les quartiers distanciables où un garçon démarre dans le casse à barre policier, etc. Et là, ça me semblait intéressant. Je pense que aujourd'hui, et ça c'est mon sentiment très profond, c'est qu'une des pires zones inconnues, ce sont les campagnes, la ruralité, en fait. Et que si ça s'était passé dans à Bobigny, à la Terre-Neuve, dans les hauts 4000, il y aurait eu une marche blanche, il y aurait eu des tas de choses, et là, il y a eu des tas de choses. Et je trouvais ça très intéressant de se dire que finalement, ce qu'on connaît le moins, c'est ces territoires où on pense, on sent tous très bien, de souffrance, etc. Mais ce sont ceux que finalement, on connaît le moins. Oui, c'est terrible, là. Il y a aussi cette histoire, absolument, aussi dans la campagne, cette jeune femme. Et puis, il y a cette histoire de cette jeune femme. Je sais pas comment dire. Wild woman of the forest. This is an incredible story, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. I was researching a story in the Cévennes. Rien à voir avec tout ce travail sur les distributions de la nourriture dans les Cévennes. J'arrive dans un village et tu me dis ah mais ici vous êtes dans ce village, etc. Et on me dit en fait c'est un village qui avait longtemps été investi dans les années 68 par ce retour à la terre, les gens qui reprenaient. Euh, voilà, tout, tout ce mouvement hippie, pour l'appeler comme ça, been, uh, et qui s'était installé un peu partout. Et donc, village, je me suis toujours posé la question, est-ce que sont devenus les enfants de hippies Est-ce qu'ils sont restés Est-ce que, est que, voilà, qu est que ça a donné Qu'est-ce qui a germé de ce mouvement-là Et donc, le, la personne à qui avec laquelle je parlais so me dit, ah, il y a une jeune femme well, well, qui est, qui est woman, une enfant de hippie, qui a la trentaine, elle est devenue une femme sauvage. Elle est devenue une femme sauvage. Elle me dit, oui, mais il ne faut pas en parler. Je dis, ah non. Ah non, trop tard. Ah là, tant pis pour vous. Et donc, cette histoire m'a passionné. Qu'est-ce qui s'est passé So that's what happened, and I got very interested in the story for several reasons. The first reason is that it is the daughter of a hippie couple who settled in this area. She went to French public school. 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 25 ans, 30 ans, and then, right around the age of 25 or 30, dans la forêt, 
She goes up in the forest and decides to settle there and decides to no longer speak uh, to uh, other humans. Now, what's interesting is that she's called the wild woman. Sont des gens what often happens qui, qui with élevés, uh, wild people à, à is that de la they have usually grown up apart from sauvage, civilization. Quand on de Mowgli, when you là, read the story of Mowgli, the jungle book, the uh, jungle book, the 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 jungle book, them how to uh, eat with là, a fork, tie their inverse. shoes, tie their shoelaces, mauvaise, and they are going to be saved by him. Whereas in this case, civilization was uh, considered as being bad, and she wants to escape from civilization. So there is a different perspective. Des, des village, départ, disaient, and what's interesting is that uh, in her case, a lot of people in, effet, in the village, the village said she dared to do what we wanted, wanted to do. Uh, we were hippies, we wanted to rediscover the countryside, we wanted to live outside of all civilization, and they never dared do it. So, but she did. So at first they were extremely proud of her because she implemented their dreams. Vous l'avez compris, elle a grandi avec un frigo, des choses comme ça. Donc elle ne sait pas pêcher la truite à main nue, attraper le lapin par les oreilles, etc. Donc comment elle survit dans un pays qui est un peu dur, un pays froid, c'est vrai, c'est qu'elle rentre dans les maisons des résidences secondaires. It's hostile, so what does she do? Connaît, well, she comme les gens sont enters pas, elle, elle uh, into un peu comme ça, elle houses, un couette, un uh, she knows the people who live there, there, she knows they're not around, she uh, enters um, their home, Alors, début, helps herself to uh, their whatever food they have, uh, uh, at uh, first people thought it was great, and they left her notes, I know you like tuna, so I've left tuna for you, and they gave her some cans for you to eat. And that's what happened at first, but after a while, uh, she really donc, did become wild. And Alors, all of these rules she did away with. So she no longer enters gently into these homes. She breaks a window. She doesn't just sleep in a bed, makes up the bed when she leaves. No, she breaks everything. She steals pictures. What people thought great at first becomes worrisome. And then all of a sudden, the village starts wondering about what they should do. My pictures had been stolen. Everything was broken in my house. So a part of the village says she's become wild, she's crazy, she's in danger, we need to help her, we need to find her and help her, and the other half of the village said no, we have to let her live that way. So there was this entire debate about what people are ready to accept, and this is why I cling to the story, and I was really interested in the story, I was there uh, driving my car, uh, and the Seven Mountains, uh, and I wondered what should I do, she's avoiding uh, all human civilization, so what should I do, should I try and meet her, which uh, was a complicated undertaking, she was hiding in the forest, a uh, very dense forest. She doesn't want to see me, so am I going to run after her with uh, my notebook, my microphone, hello, could I please interview you? It wouldn't be uh, very respectful of her, just like the police. So I thought, well, I'll do her portrait without ever meeting her. Uh, and so my idea was to get people around her to talk about her, who saw her, who didn't see her, there are people who were afraid of her, people who saw her, and who were afraid of her. Et qui ont mis des, qui ont eu peur, qui ont mis des caméras de surveillance. Et donc ils ont vu sa photo et ils étaient, on voulait la voir, on avait peur d'elle, on voulait voir à quoi elle ressemble, qui sait, on l'a jamais connue. Ils étaient curieux, ils voulaient la voir. En fait, ils ont vu une fille super bien habillée, enfin assez bien habillée avec une caméra, très bien faite, etc. Et donc c'est assez drôle parce que la fille disait, oui, alors elle vole dans nos placards. Elle a beaucoup de goût, elle prend tous les plus beaux, les plus beaux pantalons, etc. Donc voilà, ça me plaisait beaucoup de faire ce portrait. So I was quite happy doing this portrait uh, through the eyes of people who know her and people who don't. Well, this would deserve a book of its own, wouldn't it? Yes. 
Now turning to the floor, I don't know whether you've got any questions. Uh, if you do have questions, don't hesitate to raise your hand and we'll give you a microphone. <laughs> Careful, because I'm quite a talker. I think there's a hand raised over here. Claire at the front. And then I'm sure the next question will come from Claire at the back. That's what usually happens. Thanks, Natalia. Thank you. I have a similar question about l'inconnu de la poste, the stranger at the post office, that uh, a story that happened not far from here in Montréal, La Cluse. How did you get interested in this story? Were you sent by your editor-in-chief? Did you read this in a regional daily? Well, that's... My other working method, I started working as a journalist a long time ago. We didn't have social media or that kind of thing. So then... Newsroom was in full of people coming with all sorts of documents, uh, people saying, this incredible thing happened to me and only you can help me. So there were people standing in the waiting room with all sorts of documents, uh, with all sorts of... Uh, things that were highlighted on these documents and uh, they were there... Uh, because they wanted some help. And this sometimes still happens. People contact us and say, well, this is what's happened to me. Can you talk about it? And this is exactly what happened with the story of the stranger at the post office. Uh, it was August. I was working for Le Monde. In August, nothing happens. Uh, so I'm, standing, I'm just sitting there, I'm waiting for the dust to settle. Uh, the Assistant calls, says someone's trying to reach a journalist, and I say, well, I'm here. So I get connected, and uh, it's a friend of uh, this uh, actor, Gérald Thomasin, who was accused of this horrible crime in Montréal-Lacluse, and, and told me, I'm convinced he's innocent. A uh, famous lawyer used to say that uh, the only judiciary mistake I know of are so acquittals. So when people tell you they think someone's innocent, they're usually not, and that's what started my interest in this. It was a story in which uh, this young actor was accused of having murdered a young post office worker. He's a real actor, Gérald Thomasin, who was awarded a César in France. Who was found by Jacques Doyon, who was looking for real life actors. He remained uh, the way he was. He was uh, an actor, but he was homeless. He had this uh, double life. In between movies, uh, he would uh, take up drinking again. He was an alcoholic. Uh, he settled down in this village. So there was this guy uh, uh, sitting with a dog, uh, drinking beers uh, from morning to evening, and as soon as there was this murder, he was uh, the ideal suspect. It wouldn't, have happened, it wouldn't have necessarily happened this way in Paris, but it did happen in montreal la Cluse, which is a much smaller city. <laughs> Another question. What about your experience in the Ukraine? Is, does it also revolve around individual cases? Uh, do you have pros and cons? Well, I do like showing an event uh, from different points of view. Uh, to me, this uh, chic ski resort uh, was interesting because of that. There are cases in Ukraine what I was interested in was uh, to show fighters, to show people who do not fight, and people who are somewhere in between. Uh, one morning in Ukraine, for instance, uh, the, the front line is moving. Uh, I was uh, 
very close le, to the Russian le, border in the uh, east, on the eastern part of uh, Ukraine. It was at the time of the counter, Ukraine counteroffensive. Uh, uh, I was in the car, it was 6.30. Uh, Ambiance moyenne. In the morning, Vous allez vers une zone de combat, we were going towards, la voiture uh, chaotique, est-ce qu'on aura assez d'armes, on ne sait pas trop où on va, etc. Et donc, we weren't quite sure where ouais, we were going, pas la rigolade. So, uh, Et donc on est là, it on est un peu comme ça, tout le monde a sa petite tasse de café people, euh, qui, 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 qui réfroidit, il fait un petit peu froid. Et tout à coup, bon, on, on, on parle entre nous, mais discrètement. Et tout à coup, il y a quelqu'un qui est devant et est en train de téléphoner. The guy in front is uh, making a call. I asked the translator, uh, and I said, what's going on? He's taking, a, he's taking an exam. He wants to be admitted to university. He's taking the exam. So he's dressed uh, as a soldier. He's in uniform. And he's taking a Ukrainian grammar exam to be admitted in university. And so all the guys around him are whispering the solutions and the answers to the questions on the exam. And then all of a sudden, there's a question to which no one has the answer. And uh, people tell him, well, say, say you don't have any coverage. Uh, say you've got network problems. And so, Là, quand même, la période Eventually, est incertaine, on va vers said, la guerre, well, euh, vers le fond, euh, et vous passez un examen d'entrée à l'université. Et, et là, il y a pour moi exam. toute cette complexité ukrainienne. Et pour moi, ça montre comment complexes les choses sont à la fin de la guerre, si je n'ai pas de diplôme, et le gars a répondu, oui, qu'est-ce que je ferais après la guerre si je n'avais pas de diplôme Pour lui, c'était tout à fait vers l'inverse. Et on allait tout à fait vers l'inverse. Et on allait tout à fait vers l'inverse. Et donc, c'est vrai que c'est pour moi que ces moments-là sont des moments précieux. Uh, moments on est entre deux choses, invaluable uh, moments uh, because you're on, on est pas in between. Voilà, c'est sûr qu'on va vers le front, mais you're front, heading towards the front line. Yes, of course, but the, donc, front, uh, the front line is also aussi about aussi that, and that's also something that I tried to do in the Ukraine. <laughs> oui, sans vouloir euh, réveiller peut-être un traumatisme que vous cachez. I don't necessarily <laughs> want to come back to <laughs> the trauma. <laughs> That you're trying to hide. That you're trying to hide. You said that you were a horrible hostage. Does this mean that there are positive hostages, negative hostages? Well, maybe I'm not the one to answer. But quand vous êtes captif comme ça, when you're held in captivity, especially when you're a hostage, entre les mains de quelqu'un, you're literally in the hands of someone else. La porte s'ouvre, donc vous êtes dans une zone très inconfortable. Et you're held in a very uncomfortable room, and you don't know whether people are there to bring you food, to give you good or bad piece of news, whether they're there to kill you. So everything's always uncertain. You never know what's going to happen. And to fight against this, uh, I had uh, organized things at a certain way. I had my own mechanism. I followed my own way. When you're a hostage, there's this one you exercise that you've got to do, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to uh, do a video saying, I'm held hostage by such and such a person, and you've got to do this and this and that. As a journalist, uh, I had covered quite a few hostage stories, and I knew exactly that that was coming. And as a hostage, I thought, what am I ready to do? What do I want to do? What do I not want to do? I, I, I thought, well, I don't want there to be any weapons around me because it's going to make my family very sad. And, uh, and it goes against my sense of aesthetics. I refuse to say that I will be executed. It's horrible. It puts a huge amount of pressure on everybody else. If they want to convey that message, they'll say it themselves. So I had my own specifications. I gave them to uh, gave it to um, the people around me. And so they came to get me. There were weapons all over. And I had to beat up my text. And it's something I can laugh about at this stage, but uh, it was a little hard at the time. I said, no, that I don't want to say. Of course, I was very afraid, but I did tell them, no, I don't, I don't want to say that I'll be executed immediately. Yeah, well, it's for the purposes of this video, you have to do so. I said, no way, no way. Impossible, I've got family, it's impossible for me to say so. And then after, after a while, 
For non, non, a second, alors là, vous savez, you have the power. You say, alors, no, I'm not going to say this. I'm not going to say this. No way. Autant le faire tout de suite. If you, si you, you want to execute minute, me, you might as well execute me immediately. Mais moi, je vais pas le dire. Save everybody some time. Donc, y a, y a But I don't want to say so. So they start savourer, negotiating with me. C'est l'espace de liberté que vous avez. And it's a Et donc, c'est là d'où est venu chaque fois ce que je fais ça. Je ne veux même pas faire des vidéos correctement. Time. And that's pas where I thought that I was Et alors, on avait des numéros. Because there were these videos that I didn't want to do the way they wanted them to be done. Et donc, quand on était appelé dans cette zone, on était numéro de temps et vous deviez et donc moi je disais numéro 6 et ils disaient on va vous rebaptiser 0 vous êtes l'otage nul donc je suis resté ici cela dit vous avez raison parce que c'est c'est à la fois horrible et, et réellement horrible, c'est-à-dire que oh, réellement... Uh, at the same time, it's horrible. Et vous avez tout de suite cette impression d'être dans un film de Tarantino, But vous savez. Mais c'est à la fois grotesque et movie. atroce. Et, it's et, grotesque, et, et, it's et vous êtes toujours horrible. dans cet entre-deux, en fait. So you're always somewhere in between. Vous avez parlé de, de, des déclics qui font qu'on se sent dans un reportage, dans un article. Il euh, y a eu celui assez immédiat de la jeune femme sauvage où je pense que vous avez... Your idea of writing ça, an article like the young woman in the woods. I'm sure you thought right away this is going to be a great story, but it could have gone sideways. If somebody comes to you with a legal file and says you need to investigate this, at what point do you say this is a good subject for me, or I think I have to give up because we're going nowhere, we're not going to make anything significant or interesting out of this. Does it happen, does it ever happen that you drop a story halfway through? Yes, it does, unfortunately. Well, you have an obligation in terms of daily news. I see lots of stories coming through that are interesting to me, but I'm leaving for Ukraine next week, so I have my own personal schedule that influences things and keeps me from doing other things. But you've um, uh, put your finger on something that's very difficult for us as journalists. Uh, there are stories that we can't take to their logical end because either because it becomes too personal with the person you're dealing with. Une dimension publique, c'est-à-dire que vous allez entrer dans la personne, vous allez dévoiler des choses, vous allez dévoiler des choses, personal life, you're going to reveal information, this woman living in the woods has a mother, a brother, you're going to be putting out in the public uh, domain a story that's personal. So there are a lot of uh, reasons for doing it. You may want to use her as an example, or want things to change, but the story never comes to anything. I'm not talking about a specific case, but it, it has happened to me several times. The last time, I mean, I think, I hope I'll be able to finish it. Uh, is a, you're going to say that I'm always working on grim subjects, but it's a children's home in Nantes, and I hope I can reach the end of the project. It's also a scheduling issue, uh, clashes, calendar, uh, timing clashes. It's a story about um, minors in institutions, and uh, you feel guilty because a lot of people have invested a lot in your story and told you personal things. The worst story, uh, the worst thing that happened to me, it was... Uh, in Nanterre, Donc, in a a social housing. And I thought, I'm going to tell, say, report on what life is like in these social housing units when there aren't any cars burning, but uh, in, in a difficult neighborhood. So I started writing the book, and it's my fault, but I never found the right way to write the story. My editor kept saying, it's very good, it's good, it's good. And I said, no, no, it's terrible. So I, I spent a year, and then another six months, but the book never, it was never published. I spent a great year with these people, but uh, the project was never finished. So people still call me and say, I can't find your book about Nanterre, where can I find it? Uh, and then I hide under my desk. It's a phantom book. How about one last question? Florence, thank you for all your stories. The night cleaner that you mentioned briefly earlier, 
uh, saying that it was illegal because you weren't meant to hide your identity as a journalist. But uh, I'm interested because in this case, you weren't a reporter observing the situation, but you put yourself right in the middle of it. You were a participant in the story. How do you uh, keep up that role? Because this project went on for some time. The young generation of journalists today are happy to write in the first person. The American School of New Journalism uh, is based on that. Uh, journalism from the first person, in the first person. I don't like it because I think your presence uh, obstructs the narrative. I think it's the people you're writing about who should be in the forefront. The night cleaner, uh, you're right, I was playing a role, seen in a, uh, from a certain perspective. The idea was, if I go out with my microphone and talk to women who are looking for work or who are working as cleaners or domestic workers and ask them what is difficult about their work, they're not really going to answer me. They're going to say, uh, overtime's not paid. They can't say that because they'll have problems with their boss. There's a, their condition is difficult, and it's difficult to talk about because it's going to have repercussions. So the, I decided, if I want to do this, I have to... Uh, I have to leave them out of the social criticism part of it, piece of it. And then there was a dimension that I hadn't even thought about, which is uh, the dimension of being proud of your work, no matter what your job is. So I was working on, a f on ferry boats, cleaning the loos in the ferries that cross the English Channel. So people vomit, they are seasick, it's a disaster zone every night. So uh, we're two per uh, cabin, and uh, while I was cleaning the toilets, I say, why are you doing this job? And she's changing the sheets, and she says, because I'm ambitious, and I almost dropped the toilet brush, and she says, yes, I want to succeed in life, I want to go far. And some of them were forced to do this job, and for some of them, it was a, a great job. Uh, I've I think this is true in all professions. So if you show up with your microphone and you start interviewing people and questioning them, people who think what she thought are not going to reply spontaneously, they're going to tell you what they think you want to hear. Oh, it's difficult, it's a difficult job, which is also true. But you'll be missing out on a, another dimension that they're not going to tell you about. This is why I, I, I was interested in this project and and why I decided that it was worth my uh, sticking my neck out. If you want to write in the first person, I think you have to have some very good reasons. I wouldn't do this uh, myself. I have a, an American colleague, Ted Conover, who uh, disguised as him, uh, he became a prison guard in Sing Sing. The horrible uh, penitentiary near, in New York. After three months, he couldn't stand it anymore. The uh, prison conditions are pretty bad. The atmosphere is pretty bad. The uh, prison guard population is not is very macho and militarist. So he escaped and went to see back to town to see his editor and said, "Listen, I've been there for three months. I think that's enough." And the editor said. How are you going to write your book? T tell me about your book. And the he said, what do you mean? And the editor said, well, what do you mean? What's your red thread? What do you mean? The red thread is me. And the editor said, get back there. Get back to Sing Sing. And it's a good, it's a good lesson, because if you're the red thread, you're off track. If the red thread is how to tell about other people's lives, then you're on the right track. Thank you. I'm sure other questions uh, await 
meet you at the book signing upstairs. I hope a lot of people will uh, come to see you up there, Florence. Thank you very much. Merci. Merci.